And now a message from our sponsor. Hey everybody, it's Bootleg Captain, Captain Bootlegs here. Yeah! If you're like me, I bet you're enjoying this Toys, Toys on Tap, Tap podcast. I am enjoying it, it's very nice. But did you know you can enjoy it more just by joining that Patreon? Oh, I did not know that. There are so many cool perks available on the Patreon for you. There's <laughs> and also <laughs> and and wow, that's really a lot of stuff if you ask Bootleg Captain. Captain I don't Bootleg. understand, there were noises I couldn't hear with the perks. So join today to support Toys on Tap podcast and Bootleg Art Toys. But if you're not in a position to join the Patreon, head on over to Apple iTunes and review and subscribe. That helps out the channel as well. Okay, I'll go rate it, I guess. And remember, listen to Toys, Toys on Tap. Tap. Captain Bootleg, the bootleg captain sent you. Why did he keep referring to himself in the third Can person? I stop with the stupid voice now? I'm not sure why you made me want to sound like a pirate. Oh, so that was a fake voice. Oh, yucko! I, I didn't realize it was just pretend voice. Oh. Hey man, what's up? What's up? Is Dude, the sound okay? Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much for coming in clutch for Toys on Tap. Oh, of course, of course. Thank you. Dude, I it's exciting. Yeah, and I, I uh, yeah, I'm glad that you got on, and I'm glad that uh, you're a newer toy artist. So I'm glad that we get to share something new. So before we get started, please introduce yourself. Tell everyone who we're talking to right now. Okay, so my name is Roy. I go by Kiltro Toys. Um, I'm from Israel. Uh, I've been making toys for like two years for myself. And in the past month and a half, two months, I started like posting them and showing them out to the world. Yeah, dude, I'm stoked. I love when people join the toy community. It's so rad. Yeah, it's it's fun, man. It's like... I, I kind of found out about, you know, like everyone else, like uh, I was really into toys when I was a kid. Yeah. And then at some point I found out, you know, the usuals like Suck Lord and, mm -hmm. and uh, Killer Bootlegs and Death by Toys and Obvious Plant and everyone. And yeah. it was just like, okay, that's rad. And I can do that. Mm -hmm. And that's how it kind of happened. Tell me, you are you're native to Israel? Uh, it's complicated, but okay. yeah, I'm half Chilean, half Israeli. Uh, okay. I was born in Israel, but I grew up in Chile. And then we came back to Israel when I was 10. So ever since I've been here. So you have a glimpse, like you have an incredible glimpse of like um, the bootleg toys in Chile. Yeah. Right? And then you have uh, a whole nether toy like thing going on in Israel. Tell me, describe those two different lives for me. Okay, so uh, so basically, I grew up in Chile because we moved there when I was like two months old. Yeah, and the uh, the toy scene in Chile back then, it's uh, I'm a uh, 34, so it was like the early 90s. Yeah, and uh, and back then, Chile was you know just coming out of like uh, Pinochet's regime and mm -hmm. uh, and the dictatorship and everything. So there was like this huge economical and the uh, cultural like mm -hmm. a, a huge boom. And uh, I was an only child up until I was six. So and then uh, also I don't have any cousins from my Chilean side. So basically, I had a shit ton of toys. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and back then, and back then in Chile, like uh, we had pretty much everything, like all the American toys and like other different stuff. I was always into like the wackier toys. Uh, for example, my favorites were like uh, like uh, Galoob's uh, biker mice. I had like yeah. all of them. Uh, I loved Barnyard Commandos. That was mm -hmm. the name, like the little pigs with the weapons. Yeah, <laughs> those were so weird looking. I, it, it, they were just so weird that I had to have them all. It was like yeah. amazing. Also, the cards had like comics and stuff and like collectibles on the back. Yeah. Uh, I grew up reading a lot of comics because, you know, Santiago and uh, not now and not in the early 90s, it's not a place you'd send like a six year old to play outside alone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had like a lot of comics, a lot of toys. Uh, also, my parents are really young, uh, and my dad, they were practically kids when they had me. Mm -hmm. So I was six, my dad was 27, 28, so we used to basically play together with toys. Uh, and then when we moved to Israel, um, 
I don't really know what the toy situation was in here because when we moved, we moved to a kibbutz. Uh, a kibbutz is like this uh, communal socialist farm uh, okay. settlement. And suddenly it was from playing with toys inside the house to just being outside all day. And the uh, toys weren't really a thing. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I also didn't keep many of them. Uh, I kept only like, I had a lot of Bandai toys like Saint Seiya and Dragon Ball and stuff. So I kept mm -hmm. some of those and I had like this huge collectible spawn uh, figures. Uh, and so we kept those as like decorations, but I didn't really have toys anymore until I was a grown up. Yeah. Uh, until I could like get my own toys. Um, because it it was a, it really wasn't a thing. I mean, uh, usually in a kibbutz, how it happens is like you go to school in the morning and then you go eat lunch in the dining room with everyone, mm -hmm. and after that you go and I don't know do shit with your friends. But uh, <laughs> but you know it's always like playing outside, building something, going to help at work in the field or with the cows or whatever. Yeah, and uh, um, that was our fun. Yeah. Uh, now, I never lost the love for like toys and comics and pop culture and, and all of that. And uh, luckily, when, at that time, like early 2000s, the internet was becoming a thing. So I kind of had my two lives. I, I'm not a good sleeper. I've never been. So mm -hmm. during the day, I was with my friends, like, you know, doing shit around the farm and, and like going outside and taking hikes and whatever. And then at night, I would sit on the internet and like watch anime and read comics and, and all of that. Also, uh, in Israel, it's... Um, it's never been really a thing like the comics culture and everything. It's like a relatively new thing in here. Like okay. the past, I think 10, maximum 15 years. And it's been like a niche thing until I think, I guess like the, the MCU kind of stirred things around and people started noticing comics more and it became like this cool thing to, yeah. to do, uh, which is amazing for me. I hate gatekeeping. And a lot of people were like, no, but it was my hobby. And now it's like, everyone likes it. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, but now we have like huge comic stores in Tel Aviv. Yeah. You can actually get toys in Israel and it's fucking amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I bless the MCU for that, although the movies are kind of suck, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that, that was basically it. And like, I think like two years ago, three years, mm -hmm. however long ago the pandemic started. Um, Okay, so what happened, I, I graduated from art school in uh, mm -hmm. 2020, and it was like my last semester, I was doing my final project, and then uh, the pandemic started, everyone was locked at home, and my dad died, so it was like, oh. uh, yeah, it happens. Uh, it was like a, a really weird and bad time, and uh, yeah. my mom still lives in the kibbutz, and like in the south of Israel, in the middle of the desert, so I just went down there, was like two or three months with my mom, worked on my final project. I did like a comic book, a, a really long comic book. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I went. I lived in Jerusalem back then. And uh, I went back to Jerusalem and suddenly it was like, okay, I'm not a student anymore. Uh, and there's a pandemic and what's going on. And I started sculpting a lot. Um, now, my background with all of that is I basically I have been drawing since I could handle a crayon mm -hmm. since like two or three years old. And uh, my dad, he was like this amazingly creative person. He drew really well and he was a musician. I grew up in like this punk household. He was a punk musician. Uh, so we always had like, you know, comics and cartoons and stuff and cool stuff at home. And like he, all of his friends were like musicians and painters and sculptors and photographers. So I kind of yeah. grew up with all that around. And, and then when we moved to Israel, all of that changed drastically because suddenly we were farmers. Like my dad yeah. worked in the date fields, uh, plantations and in the, with the cows. I worked also uh, in the in the fields like you know, growing up onions and potatoes and, and milking cows. <laughs> and uh, and I always kept drawing, but it was like a hobby uh, more yeah. than everything. And then I went to the army. And after the army, it was like, it's uh, three years mandatory service. 
uh, which is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, after that, it was like, okay, so what the fuck am I going to do with my life? Mm-hmm. And uh, back then I had a girlfriend that was doing a social work uh, degree uh, in the north of Israel. And I moved up there to live with her. And it was like, okay, I've been milking cows like half of my life. I'll keep doing that. Mm-hmm. And I just went heading into the business. Uh, and so practically I worked with cows from like 14, 15 till I was 28. Holy geez. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, all the time, I like I kept creating all the time. I've been DJing since since I'm 17, and I always kept drawing and stuff. But for me, and uh, and when I was 28, we broke up, and uh, she went back north. We lived in some in a, another kibbutz, like in the south. And I was like, okay, so what am I gonna do? And then I said, all of my friends were like, you need to to draw, you need to be an illustrator, an artist, whatever. And I said. Okay, you know what? Maybe maybe there's something there. Uh, I will try. And then I went to like, in my opinion, the best art school in Israel. And I said, okay, I'm 28. It's kind of a late age in Israel to to go study or everywhere basically to go like do do your first degree. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna try once. If I get in, fine. I'll do it. And if not, I'll go back to the cows. I, I'll always have like something to do yeah and then I found out I I didn't uh, I got kicked out of high school when I was 17 Um, I wasn't a good good student I just wouldn't go that's the thing I wasn't a bad student but I I, well I didn't attend so Mm -hmm. they kicked me out and uh, then the university told me okay but you need like your all your finals from school from high school and I was like okay fuck Uh, and I found out I basically needed to do like all of high school in one year. Uh, so I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hard. Uh, yeah. And then I went, I applied to like the two best uh, art schools in Israel. Uh, somehow I got accepted to both of them. I picked the one in Jerusalem. And like this whole new chapter in my life started. Um, and and this is where I am now. Like I did, that's my job. I'm an illustrator and a graphic designer. Mm-hmm. That's like my day job. Um, and the sculpting thing, it was when I was little, I used to sculpt a lot of gifts for my mom that yeah. she would put in her office. I, I have photos at my mom's place that all these little like plasticine dolls that I used to make for her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I never did that again. And then, as I said before, when I finished school, it was like, okay, I, I need something to do. And because like most of the illustration people do today is like digital, I work mainly with an iPad and on Photoshop. I said, okay, I really miss working with my hands and getting dirty. And I I didn't know anything. So I just went like to the art supply store and picked a, a brick of Sculpey, mm-hmm. went back home, and I started sculpting like crazy, uh, and for like a year, that was a uh, that's what I was doing. Uh, and uh, all of the time, like I I started seeing you know all the designer toys, like all the the boring stuff, like the dunnies and the, those how are those awful bears like the bre- be- be- bear bricks and oh uh, yeah. All the boring stuff, yeah, like yeah. Coz, yeah. which I like Coz, like he's a huge inspiration, but it's getting boring. He's doing the same thing <laughs> like 10 years now. Yeah. Uh, um, like the companions are cool. It's a cool character, but man, you need to move on. Mm-hmm. Uh, although if I became a millionaire from like one character, I would keep doing it as well. So <laughs> I'll over there. Um, and then at some point I said, okay, I... I want to make my own toys. I mean, I like this shit, but everything I see is like kind of boring to me. I think I can make my own. Mm -hmm. And I went into YouTube and I just wrote, you know, like DIY toys. And of course, uh, steady crafting was like the first thing that came up. Yeah. Just like everyone went into down the long, long rabbit hole of watching everything that man does. That man is a godsend in YouTube, I think. And um, and that's and that's how it came to be. I mean, I I was sure I wouldn't get be able to get like the supplies to make that, uh, but apparently there was this one company in Israel that have everything you need, like all the smooth on products and like everything. Mm-hmm. 
So I just dove in, like bought like a gallon of uh, resin, like some silicone and just started making shit. Of course, like always, I wasted God knows how much money making mistakes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, slowly but surely, it became better and better. And um, and that's it, basically. <laughs> that's so much stuff. How did you, yeah. uh, when you were in the community, the like uh, social socialist group, how did you keep, kibbutz. yeah, in kibbutz, how did you keep um, your, like the art side of yourself? How'd you keep that alive? Uh, so the kibbutz is uh, very much, uh, they they really let you and drive you to do the stuff the stuff you like other than the stuff you need to do mm-hmm. so i first i i learned i had art classes in school i was like majoring in in art in high school although i didn't finish mm-hmm. and uh, and also i was like you know the guy that draws stuff so like every graduation t-shirt or like everyone who needed something like to to, to draw something it was always like i was the guy to do that mm-hmm. um And when I got kicked out of high school, I was sure the kibbutz will like, you know, fuck me up. Like you need to finish your studies and everything. And uh, at the time, the guy in the kibbutz that was like the, I don't know how to translate it, but he was like in charge of the the people my age of our education. Mm -hmm. He sat with me and he said, okay, man, look, I know school is not for you. Uh, What do you want to do? And I said, I could go into the army. I was 18 already, so I could go into the army practically immediately. And I told him I don't want to go to the army yet. Also, we have in Israel this thing that's called like a a service year that you go and like do community service and do stuff one year before the army. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that with my friends, uh, the guys my age. So I postponed the army for like a year and a half. And uh, and then he told me, okay, so you can go work, go work at the fields or with the cows or whatever, but what else? You need to do something else. And the kibbutz actually paid for me. Okay, the kibbutz I grew up in is like in the middle of fucking nowhere. It's like in the south of Israel, in the middle of the desert, like mm-hmm. four or five hours by car from Tel Aviv, uh, which in Israel is a lot because Israel from side to side is like seven hours yeah <laughs> uh, so it's not like the usa that ah yeah it's a five hour drive it's like mm-hmm. short um and i used to actually fly to tel aviv every thursday uh, and had illustration classes wow uh, and the kibbutz paid for it because you know like there's no you you don't have you have your own money but like the kibbutz is still a, a socialist thing mm-hmm. and so they paid for everything so for almost a year i had illustration classes with a great teacher that uh, in in a we interrupted this broadcast of toys on top to bring you this meanwhile in a galaxy of bootleg treasures dov2 we have engine failure we must crash land on dke to a planet oh my we're doomed <laughs> Wait! Salvation! Hooray! We're saved the deal, V2! Limited edition custom artist-made action figures and DKE toys! Check out www.dkatoys.com for a full catalog. Hooray for custom action figures! DKE! One of the two schools I applied for later, it was like an outside course. And, and the kibbutz was always all about that. Now all the all the people in the kibbutz, for example, that have like artistic hobbies or like an artistic side, the kibbutz really really gives them like the the means to do that. Mm-hmm. For example, there's like this huge uh, uh, woodworking uh, studio that you can go and do stuff and like you know all the old ladies that make like plush toys or like uh, pottery or whatever they have their yeah. studio. Um, and it's really nice. Um, so that's how it kept going. And basically, I always had a sketchbook on me. That was the thing. Like I was always drawing or or photographing. I never used to leave house without a camera and my sketchbook. Mm-hmm. And that's how I kept it going. Hmm. That's crazy. I. Uh, it's almost like uh kibbutz what that sounds like is like a commune here 
where it's like you're separate from society. Is that was it completely separate from everyone? Uh, it is and it isn't at the same time because okay. like from one side, you know, it, we're still we're a really small country and there's like I think there's like 200 kibbutz, kibbutzim, kibbutzes in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are, uh, they're privatized. So they're not like social, totally communes already, but the one I grew up in still is. Okay. So from, on one hand, we grew up like in this small sheltered bubble, you know, with the same people and like a really specific set of, ideologies and everything mm -hmm. uh, and from the other side you know we used to go to Tel Aviv to party and to see concerts and like we had the internet it's not yeah. like uh, now or like our experiences and like the stuff we used to do when we grew up it's really different from like the city kids yeah so so that was in the army you you like kind of pop the bubble and then suddenly like you get to know all the all the how Israel Israel really works mm -hmm. and it was kind of a shock uh, in the beginning but uh, suddenly you get used to it you can yeah. live in about all your life yeah what is it so I mean this isn't toy related uh we don't live like in the U.S. we don't have mandatory service what's that like uh oh <laughs> that's a good question so it's something that specifically in the kibbutz, like the kibbutz is like, uh, like the, the ideology in the kibbutz is like the old Zionist ideology of, you know, like uh, making a good place in Israel. Also, it's like a left side thing, mm -hmm. like we need to be, you know, Israel is for, for everyone and still it's like a Jewish country. Now, nowadays, I don't agree with most of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can, I became kind of radicalized, but the uh, it's not the, the subject, uh -huh. um, but the in the army service, when you grow up in the kibbutz, it's like something you grow up knowing it's an important thing to do. And like, if you can, you you strive to do like the the best, quote unquote, service you can, like being a, a, a fighter or in a special unit or whatever. Uh, and it's just kind of how it is. I mean, most of the people at that age, at like 17, 18, you don't really think about it too much. It's like, you know that when you finish school, you're going to go to the army for three years. Mm -hmm. And that's how it is. Like, there are people that don't go, like, for ideological reasons. Uh, and I really appreciate them. But at the time, I think I wasn't in a state of mind that I could really do that decision on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you go and suddenly one day you go like to the base and you get your uniform and it's like, okay, fuck you, bye. Uh, and suddenly you go home like two times a month, maybe. Uh, and you're a kid, man. You're just a kid and, and everything changes. I was I served in a, um, in a combat engineering unit. I was a medic like in a, in a, in a combat engineering uh, unit. And uh, it's fucked up, man. I mean, yeah. um, it, ch it, changes, it changes your whole life. Um, people always say, and I really agree, that like everyone in Israel has PTSD. Uh, also, I I've been like diagnosed with kind of severe PTSD. I've been medicated for the last couple of years after, you know, most of the people in Israel or age have been at war, which mm -hmm. sucks, man. I mean, yeah. um, like... There's like this collective cloud of PTSD over Israel. Um, and it's not a pleasant thing, um, but everyone just kind of lives with it. Yeah. Is there a punishment if you don't go? You go to jail. Okay. For how long? I'm not really sure. It depends. I think like in the beginning, like in the 80s or 70s, when the first people started saying, OK, fuck this shit. I don't want to go to the army because like, you know, it's an apartheid system and whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I think they went to jail for a long time. Nowadays, I think you go for like a month. Oh, uh, but but I'm not sure. But also, you know, at 18, going like for a month to a military jail for not wanting to to go and conquer like people it's it's kind of fucked up yeah um but yeah also so i think you i think most of the people like 
even those that don't want to go like ideologically, usually you find like a medical reason or like uh, you say you're like insane or whatever, and then you get out without jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some people like do it. They 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 find like they want to say they don't want to go ideologically, like to make a statement, mm-hmm. uh, and then they go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Holy jeez. We have um, something here called selective service. So if um, if there's ever like a draft and they need people, when you're 18 and a male, you have to sign up for it. So they can technically call us. Like if, it, if everything go, all yeah. goes to shit, they can call us and figure out. When it goes to shit. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll meet you in uh, World War uh, Three. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it might be in Russia at the moment. So who knows what's happening. Sadly. Um, so like you get to this point where you go to school, how does that change? Cause you, you're a fantastic artist, right? You function you. under, uh, Royce you. Eagle, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's like my, um, that's the name I go by, like uh, for my illustration work and like, uh, that's the name I go by usually. Yeah. Which is great. I, I, I like followed Royce Eagle for a while um because it's just so fast like i love your art style thanks man appreciate it when you go to uh school for art when you realize this is what i'm gonna do you get in you go how did you get to your style because i i there's this weird thing about art schools where they try to teach you like realism and stuff that might not matter as much how'd you get to this yeah, so the first two years, it's like only mandatory classes. Like yeah. you, so you do everything. You do like typography and design and uh, and video and photography and uh, realism and illustration and whatever. And then on the third year, we were separated into like different, um, different, uh, uh, I don't know how to call it, but like majors. Different- Schools. Majors, exactly. So I majored in illustration. Uh, we were like 15, I think, in the illustration major. There were like another 15 doing like gaming design and mm-hmm. uh, all the rest were doing uh, graphic design. Um, and it's funny that you ask because I I don't think I have a style. Like I don't see it. Okay. I just draw. I, I feel like everything I do is like different. And, and then people tell me, oh, I could say at, at the moment I saw it I could say it was yours and I'm like mm-hmm. really how uh, but I think a lot of people are like that um, and I don't know it's kind of like I, I had like fantastic illustration uh, teachers um, like some of the best illustrators in Israel uh, teach me which was like this huge privilege we had uh, and the thing I like the most is like a lot of the the thing they emphasized on the illustration classes was actually that, like finding your own, like your own hand, we used to call it, like your own handprint, uh, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, and I think a lot of what they do is just, you know, like everyone does, you start stealing a little bit from there and, oh, I like how he does that. And like, yeah. you start making this whole new thing of your own. Um like the biggest inspirations I have, I think, are like Robert Crumb is like I think mm-hmm. my all-time favorite, and also a lot of comics artists like like alternative comics, you know, like um, uh, Daniel Close and um, all different kind of stuff like that. And then uh, slowly it becomes like your own thing. Yeah. Also, I'm glad to say that like all of my friends or most of my friends are like artists in their own way, like musicians and also illustrators, tattoo artists, uh, painters, photographers. And I've been surrounded for the past seven, eight years with amazingly talented people. So I get to learn from them also all the time. Yeah. Um, and also it's nice because, you know, we we had a saying in school that if you want someone to tell you what you do is nice, you show it to your mom. But <laughs> if you show it to a colleague, you need to get ready to get like to to get critique. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the best thing that can be like most of the stuff I do. I show to, to my friends before and I show them 
not for them to tell me it's pretty, but for them to tell me, okay, it's nice, but mm-hmm. but you maybe this and maybe that, and uh, that's the best way to to learn, I think. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of people that um, uh, when they they are like very insecure or they're very uh, like I don't know, I don't know what the word is, but like when they get critiqued, they stop creating. But it's like no, 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 keep going, keep creating, use that. Yeah, exactly. So I think more than art school, I think like the the best critique I had or like the best way to learn how to receive critique I had was my dad. Mm. Because as I said, my dad was an amazing illustrator and painter. And when I was like, uh, I don't know, like four or five, Usually at that age, you come like with your, you come with like your wacky drawing, show it to yeah. your mom, and she's like, oh, it's so nice, and puts it on the fridge. So my house wasn't like that. <laughs> I used to go to my dad, like, hey, dad, look, and he would he used to look at it and said, okay, it's nice, but look, this leg is bigger than the other, and like the composition is not right, or mm-hmm. the perspective is wacky and stuff like that. But it was always like in a good vibe, like, okay, let's sit down and I'll show you. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that way, you get you learn how to receive critique. And then yeah. uh, when you go to art school, suddenly on the first year, mainly you see people that have never been critiqued in their life. And like yeah. on the final season, like uh, every end of semester, like you can hear crying in the bathrooms and in the <laughs> stairways. And uh, yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. No, it, it, it was a, it, it was four years intensive, very very intensive. Uh, so I I get the crying. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, so you created toys for yourself, and at some point you decided that you wanted to branch off from Royce Eagle and yeah. make your own style of toys and everything. What made you want to do that? What made you want to bring it to the public? Okay, so like I said, like two years ago, I started sculpting a lot, and, yeah. uh, and I started posting some of the stuff I made. Uh, and the first time I got like a like a response from someone that wasn't like my friend or like a long time follower or something, I made. Mm-hmm. I'll show you. It's a uh, Coco oh, the Clown great. from uh, from the Fleischer uh, Brothers animation. Yeah, looks great. Thanks. So I made this and I posted it on Instagram uh, and suddenly I got a DM uh, from, I don't, I don't remember the name, but from some company. Mm-hmm. And the guy just said, Hey man, I'm the official, uh, we're the official merch, uh, merch company that does all the Fleischer brothers, like, uh, like all their stuff, all their uh, uh, characters. Yeah. Loved it. I'm going to show it to the, to the, Fleischer, well, they're the sons of the of Mike's Fleischer and the originals, but I'm gonna show it to them. They're gonna love it. Now, nothing happened from it, but I was so excited. Yeah, and it was like, oh my god, I made it, and and someone who's actually like has like the the makes the legit thing, he loved it, and like, okay, maybe there's something to it. And I started sculpting a lot, a lot, a lot, and like making casts of st- things, just trying to learn. And then at some point, um, okay, so back then I was struggling a lot with like addiction, um, mm-hmm. like mainly like uh, uh, pills and stuff and various drugs. Yeah. And uh, I was at a very, very low point in my life. Uh, and. I just woke up one day, looked at everything and said, fuck this shit, it all sucks. And I broke all of them. This is like the only thing that survived. Mm -hmm. Uh, I broke everything and said, I suck at this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it anymore. Uh, And luckily uh, my then girlfriend and now wife, which is like the best person I know, Mm -hmm. she was like, no, fuck you. You're going to keep doing it. (laughs) Um, and uh, now, and and then I moved out of Jerusalem. And thankfully, I've been clean for almost a year and a half now. Nice, congrats. Uh, I've been sober, thanks. Um, one day at a time, as they say. Yeah. And, uh, and then I kept making stuff and making stuff. And I wouldn't show it to anybody because, like, I have my own standard. Uh, mm-hmm. And I could, like, never meet it. 
Thursday night, 7 p.m. YouTube Live, it's Toys Alive! Toys Alive! Toys Alive! Toys Alive! This way cool artist unboxing no accounts under a thousand followers. What? Art out there for 30 bucks or less. Radical. Collector spotlight. Ooh, collector. Current upcoming shows and drops. Drop. Giveaways. What? Short chats with artists. News from the hood. 100% indie all the time. That's, That's Toys Live. Toys Live. Thursday nights, 7 p.m. PST, YouTube Live. But I. I felt like I'm I'm getting better and better. Now my wife, she lives in France now because she did her master there and she she lives there now and I'm moving to France in like a couple months, I hope. Okay. Um and she has a, we joke that she has a, my shrine uh, at her house because she has like all the prototypes I've ever made. Yeah. And, uh, the first time I said, "Okay, I'm going to make a toy." I I sculpted there's this thing in israel like i don't know like you guys have like pop tarts or like food does it food that's really like embedded in the culture mm -hmm. so in here there's like this schnitzel made of corn it sounds weird when you say oh, okay it like that, but it's like a huge thing and everyone loves it and it's like yeah. the thing that you come home from school and you like throw it in the oven and make yourself a lunch and i made like this corn schnitzel dude uh, with like a bite out of him and I yeah. made a, a mold and and it came out great and I was like oh shit it works yeah like like it works now I, I in the end I never made them and like the only one that remains my wife has it but uh, for me that little schnitzel that's like the turning point and then like two months ago uh, I told her I was speaking with with her and I told her you know what I think it's time I think I, I I I mean it's it's been burning like in 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 the back for so long, mm -hmm. and all of my friends I've been hearing for the last two years like yeah I want to make toys I want to make toys I want to make toys and everyone knew I was like cooking stuff in my studio yeah but nobody saw anything and then it was like fuck it I'm gonna make it and yeah. uh, um, and the first one I made was like the Hulkbert the, which is the so good. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like a silly drawing I did like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, that, that could be like a thing. And uh, the, the thing is, it's really hard to get action figures in Israel. Uh, and they're expensive. I had to, the, the Hulk itself, I ordered it from Amazon, like a new one, because we don't have like a secondhand market with like uh, action figures and everything, because all the classics, like the 375, you know, Star Wars and, and Jane Joe's, they never had in, had them in Israel. So, so it's not like you can find them for cheap. Yeah. Um, so I ordered it, I made it, I posted it. I, okay, I wanted to post it. And then I said, okay, am I going to post it like in the Roy Siegel account? Am I going to make a new thing? And I started thinking and they said, a good friend of mine that was with me in school, uh, he said, okay, you have to call this Roy Saras. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, no, it's a little bit too on the nose. Like, I don't yeah. like it. And I was, for, I think for a month, I was like thinking about a name. And then one day I said, okay, I like my Chilean heritage is something I really uh, treasure. And, and it's like a big part of me. And I said, okay, I want it to be something like that comes from there. In the beginning, it was like just Royce toys or Royce bootlegs. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want it to be under my name. I wanted to be like the, this standalone thing. I, I usually don't, uh, for example, if you've seen it, you've never seen my face on Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I don't like showing my face. And I think like Royce, it's his own thing. And I wanted this to be its own thing. Uh, and like, it really doesn't matter to me that people know that I'm doing them as long as people like them. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to be like, to have its own life. And I started thinking and thinking and thinking about names. And then uh, Kiltro is, okay, Kiltro in uh, Chilean Spanish, it's like a, a mutt, like a mixed breed dog. Okay. And usually you call that like the dogs on the street that live in the street. Mm -hmm. And one day it just came to me and I was like, okay, that's, that's a great name. And I added another L for, you know, English speaking people for, to actually read it like it's supposed to be. And mm -hmm. also because it sounded cool, it looks cool. 
And I showed it to my wife and I said, okay, I think I have a name. I think that's it. And she looked at it and she said, it's weird. <laughs> why not? And she said, why not, for example, Kintro? And I told her, because it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like, okay, that's going to be the name. And I think in like three hours, I made the, the Hulkbert thing and posted it just to, to say, okay, there it is. And ever since I did that, I've been making toys like crazy. Yeah. I can't stop. Um, and it's been so much fun. Yeah. So for Hulkbert, uh, I'm looking at it right now. The Do you have, so that's a comic in the US or it was, and it was a show. Hilbert. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does it exist in Israel too, or did you just come across it one day? Uh, I've known it. Like I said, I like grew up in the internet basically, yeah. but I, I think Dilbert did get to Israel at some point uh -huh. because, you know, also like high tech work and offices in Israel, it's like a huge thing. So it, it kind of speaks to people over here. Yeah. And also it, it was like big enough. It was like a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know how it came to be, but at some point it was probably, it was so long ago that it was probably just high and like Haha, Dilbert, like Hulk with the Dilbert head. That's funny. Yeah. And, uh, and I've had that drawing sitting like on my iPad for like two and a half years. And it was like, okay, that, that could be a, a cool toy to make. And also it was the first time I didn't use Sculpey. So it was like the, that, that was like the, the challenge for me. Mm -hmm. because you can't bake the, the Hulk body because it's plastic. Uh, so it's the first time I used the milliput, like epoxy putty. Yeah. Um, and it was like, okay, this, this is possible. This is going to happen. Um, and then I, I started like, you know, sourcing different things. Uh, and that's where like the toy community comes, comes into place because everyone has been so nice and helping so much. Yeah, like I've asked a lot of people things. Uh, I, I've asked you a lot, yeah. uh, and also there's this guy from the UK, Digital Horseplay. If you know who he is, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so he's been really helpful as well. I love his style. I love his figures. It reminds me of like my illustrations. So at first, I, I he was one of the first ones I, I saw that was doing something that I liked. And it helped me a lot with casting and painting and everything. Now, I do have a background in painting and everything from art school, but it's mm. different, obviously. Uh, and, and slowly, slowly, I started like to understand how everything works. For example, like the backing cards. Mm -hmm. It was kind of obvious that, okay, I need to print it and put it on cardboard. And then I hide like the, the punch because I make a lot, of, a lot of sticker packs and I love how it looks with like with the T-hole. Yeah. Uh, and I had like the, the corner punch and everything. And I said, okay, but what cardboard should I use? And uh, at first, like the half one is huge. It's like this thick. Uh, and actually, uh, in one of your episodes, you said that you started using a uh, comic uh, backing boards. Yep. Now you can't get those in Israel. Okay. So last week I was in France. I went to a comic store and got myself like a huge pack of. Yeah, uh, I have those too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So today I made the first one with them, like um, the a toy that I posted today, the walk hard one. Yeah. And it feels amazing. It's like this is how it should be. So. Yeah. Uh, and also the blisters. The blisters was like a a, a whole thing to get a hold of because. Mm -hmm. I no one in Israel makes them obviously right. uh, and shipping is expensive so I found like empire blisters and there's this other guy what's his name uh it's a good time for to, to is shout it DKE? out uh no uh, no uh, guard uh, cardback customs uh, like some oh, guy yeah. from Germany yeah yeah mm -hmm. So I found him and I ordered like a bunch of blisters to friends, to my wife's place, but I didn't have them yet. And I like, I was like, I just wanted to make toys so much. So actually what I did, I just went like twice, three times a week to the dollar store. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say they grew up in a punk household, but yeah. I just shoplifted small stuff like with the, with blisters that uh, I could use. Yeah. And I, I have this great method now, like to take the, the glue off, I would just sit and like put a movie or whatever and like scrap the, the glue off with alcohol, with rubbing alcohol. Uh, and I just 
got myself like a bunch of blisters of shitty blisters from dollar store and I just started using them yeah uh, and luckily now I have real ones from Germany and yeah. I also put a, like a huge uh, order from uh, from Empire uh, blisters because I wanted different sizes yeah Empire they just made um I don't know if you've seen it Empire so Empire is run by um Texas tea customs. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've listened to to his episode in the podcast yeah. as well. Yeah, they just uh, did. Uh, they made a new blister. Have you seen the one that clamps? And it's yeah, that, yeah, it's yeah. Really I got some cool. of those too. I got yeah. some of those too for some. Usually, I'm not into making like the clamshell thing because I think they should stay closed. Like you yeah. know, I, I glue them to the back, and I think like it. I look at the stories like as a whole art piece. For me, it's like you know, being from an like quote unquote artistic culture background i just see them as like you know it's pop art it's using ready made it's like it's almost dada in in its way like you know yeah. Marcel Duchamp and stuff like that and the warhol would make toys if if he was around now i think yeah um and as you've said many times before in other interviews i think that we really we really are privileged to be in a time that like the the old masters Mm -hmm. They're not old yet. Like, I mean, we have Killer Bootlegs and, of course, Sacklord and all those guys that actually made this thing happen around and working, and it's amazing to see it. Uh, but uh, there are people that want to open them up and look at the toy. So yeah. I, have a few, I, I have a few custom commissions that I ordered uh, clamshells for them so they could take it out and, like, you know, hold it. Yeah. But usually I, I would rather not let them give them the option. Yeah, you know, I um when people call me because they want to do customs, uh, like of them, um, I give them the option. Like if you want it to pull out, that will change how I design and stuff. Um, but if I'm gonna do it so that you can't get it, I glue that figure to the the backer. I don't want it to move. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a pain in the ass when they want to pull it out. Yeah. So, um, but uh i'm doing what so uh my figure i'm working on right now for designer con um i'm only casting the top portion of it because I, I it doesn't get removed i, I want it to yeah stay. so actually I, I i don't remember who it was but you were talking about that as well with someone mm -hmm. that said like yeah no one's gonna see the back of it so why make it right and i actually have like two figures in the making right now that are just the front as well also it's much easier to cast that way you can do like an open back uh, yeah. mall and it's way easier um so yeah i've been doing that as well yeah i because it's like it depends on what i'm trying to convey like i have um giant robot ones that i've cast and it's all articulated so it'll never get put in a blister or anything yeah but if it's not supposed to be articulated or anything i'm not gonna put if in if you're not gonna take it out also why do the articulation i mean like, right it's such a waste of time yeah and i just I don't know. I like work full time and do this podcast. And so toy making is like a side of a side thing that I do. Yeah. So uh, I can't waste time doing things, especially if I don't have to. Exactly. It's time and uh, well, time is money, but uh, yeah. yeah, like doing all the articulation means you have to do like five different molds for each piece. And I don't know, I find it easier, like, just making one static thing. If someone wants or if I want to make articulation, I still do the legs, like, stiff. Yeah. Because that way they don't fall. I hate when they fall because the leg, like, moves. Yeah. What is, so you, you were talking about it's harder to get certain toys in Israel. Um, is that, like, with all toys that are made right now? Or is it just, like, vintage toys? Uh, vintage toys you can't find at all like the yeah. only place you could find them is like i don't know through facebook marketplace from like the few collectors that are in israel or like if you know people yeah uh, the newer toys also like i i every toy store i see i i go in like to see what they have yeah and there's almost there's close to nothing like in the action figure 
uh, kind of thing. Like you get, we have like the the huge Marvel ones, you know, like the I don't know, twelve legends. Inch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the bigger the, ones. Yeah. The, the, the yeah, the big ones. So you have those everywhere, and you have like you know geek shops and comic shops that hold a little bit, but also only like collectibles that are super expensive. There are more like sculptures more than yeah. action figures. Um, lately I've been seeing like the new generation of the Ninja Turtles. I, mm-hmm. I don't know who makes them, but they just says Nickelodeon on the top, but uh, I love those. I think yeah. they're really cool looking. So I've been, I've been getting them every time I see them. I think I almost have all of them uh, mm-hmm. already. Although I'm not a collector, but I love them so much that, that I just get them. Yeah. Uh, and only it's the only toy I've seen that's reasonably reasonably priced, but uh, but yeah, basically you can't find anything here, nothing. Like you've I've I've heard people talking about like using the Fisher Price Adventure people for for like the the base. Yeah, and I've never heard of them. And I looked it up and I found on eBay like people sell them for really cheap, but the shipping is like hundred bucks. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's crazy. It's crazy. Like I wanted one for a specific one, one of the like, I don't know, mountain climbers to, to do a specific piece. And like, I found it for like two bucks on eBay, but the, the shipping was like 150. That's so uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shipping is nuts. So now just everyone, the good thing about like talking to my friends for two years about toys is that now everyone knows what i'm doing uh also it's not a thing in israel like it i'll touch on that in a moment but so now everyone that goes abroad i can i feel like i can tell them okay so if you find anything like yeah. this and these like star wars just bring them to me i just came back from france with like a, a baggie full of like loose star wars figures to do shit with them mm-hmm. like the one i did today this used to be like a, a kid anakin yeah oh, yeah yeah yeah, I wanted the one with the ball cut, but I didn't find it, so I had to sculpt the hair myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, you practically can't get action figures in Israel. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so it makes everything, and I think that's also one of the one of the reasons that there's no toy scene in Israel. It's like, I, I kind of knew it and I, I told my wife and friends, I told them, you know, I don't want to be the only one doing this. I, I'm not going to be like the guy that makes toys. I don't like it. I don't like like being the guy. Yeah. Um, and and it kind of became, I, I am the guy <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> The moment I started posting them because uh, Roy Siegel has like not significant, but I have like my followers and uh, people know who I am and I've been touch wood working fine, like as an illustrator for the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and suddenly people started messaging me like, oh, my God, man, what is this? It's amazing. I had no idea that like bootleg toys existed. And I, I've been like diving into this and I I where did this come from? Yeah. And I've been telling everyone, like sending them, you know, the podcast and telling them, go look up Sucklord and Killer and everything. And suddenly people are like DMing me, ah, do you know this? And sending like, you know, Death by Toys. And I'm like, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and suddenly one, this one guy that I didn't really know, he's like a friend of friends. He wrote to me, oh my God, man, I've been like so into this as well. He just got a resin printer and started making like skeletors to make yeah. stuff with them. And it's like amazing. So I really think we're like the only two people in Israel at the moment, like making this. Okay. Because it's such a small country and such a small, like also like the old design and art scene, everyone knows everyone. So if there were more, I would know by this point. Yeah. Uh, because people already know I'm like the dude that's making toys now. Yeah. Uh, now the nice part of it is that since the second thing I posted, people actually started wanting to buy them, mm. which for me was like crazy. I I'm not doing it for the money uh, and it was like something I had to do for myself, but you know, like getting your costs back is nice. Yeah. I'll never say no to that. Coming on video cassette. They were star-crossed lovers in a Western town. Oh, this Western town so beautiful. Yeah, girl. Not as beautiful as me though. Uh-huh. 
Okay. Suddenly call the police. There's a bad man around. I'm the bad man. <laughs> Evil laugh. What do we do? But he wanted to shoot them with the gun. Pow, pow. Running down. Underground. He was in a dive bar. In the western town. What do we do? It all seemed lost, and that's when, coming from the sky. Huh? Not a bird. Not a plane. Well, kind of a bird, because he's a chicken. It was chicken, chicken burger disco. Western hero. That's right, guys. I'm here to help you out. Hey, bad guy. <laughs> yeah? Time to get punched in the face. <laughs> it's an epic adventure like never before. Thank you, Chicken Burger Disco. Just doing my job, man. Available soon on Video Cassette. And also, I love, I love making gifts for people. I, it's one of the things I like the most. Like, a lot of my friends for the past year have been getting like little toys or sculptures I made specifically for them for like birthdays and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and suddenly, I don't know, I got a DM from a friend. Hey, a friend's birthday is coming up. I want to give her like a specific toy, like a custom made toy. It was like the Chiburashka thing, the Russian thing I posted. And I was like, OK. And he asked, OK, how how much will it cost? And that's always like the hard part. Yeah. Uh, and luckily my wife is not an artist and she has like her feet on the ground and she was like, you're not gonna take less than whatever she said. And I was like, okay, you're the boss. Um, <laughs> and, and people are actually willing to pay what I would like to, to, to charge, which for me is amazing. I, yeah. I didn't think it was a thing. Um, and that's what I thought it's going to be like, you know, making a little bit of commissions and sometimes toys for myself and everything. And then I posted the golem. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw that? Yeah. It was a silly idea. I was coming back from a friend's birthday, a little bit drunk. And I said, oh, you know what would be cool? Like putting just like a clay piece uh, in, in a becker and saying, OK, it's your DIY golem. Yeah. And I didn't think too much about it. And I posted it and I went to sleep. And then I woke up with 200 followers more. So uh, crazy. And yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, you can never know what's going to be like a hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, two Yiddish-speaking um, pages on Instagram, like one with like 150K, the other one with like 20K, mm -hmm. they reposted it. And I started getting a lot of DMs from like Jewish Americans that wanted to buy one. And, and there soon will be up for sale. And I think that's like my first and only hit for the moment just a yeah. plug and play inside a inside a <laughs> blister which is amazing yeah i think and, it's incredible it's incredible like you're absolutely right you never know what's gonna hit and then when it does hit you either have to like be on top of it and just start producing or you yeah. just have to let it go and see what happens yeah, so sadly, I was abroad when it happened, so I yeah. couldn't like start producing at the moment. But uh, Hanukkah is coming uh, in uh, November, perfect, and uh, it's like a custom to give Hanukkah gifts, and I'm sure that will be like a, a thing because <laughs> a lot of those people like like asked me when can I get them. I want them for Hanukkah, and like all of them are following, so I'm sure it will be fine. And also that specific toy like rates raised some interesting questions with people. I was eating dinner with my wife and her dad and his partner uh, in Paris like a week ago, and we were talking about the toys. Yeah. And then he said he asked me, "Okay, so like and now he, he's an amazing guy. He's like a, a he, history of TV of television professor in the university. Like mm. he's into cool stuff." And then he said, okay, so you made that thing. It's like a piece of clay with a backer. Yeah. What if someone else, like he said, you can't like copyright it. So what if someone else makes it? Or or what are you going to do then? Because yeah. everyone can do it. And I told him that for me, that's exactly the thing. Like I told him, if anyone else comes now and say, hey, here's another DIY golem with a different backer. For me, first of all, if he took the idea for me, I'm flattered. Mm -hmm. Second, I'm left to hope that mine is better. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and the third thing I told him, I'm pretty sure it's not the first time it's been made. I mean, I haven't seen it, but it's such a simple idea that I'm sure someone has done it. 
Yeah. And, and with almost every idea I have, uh, it's like, okay, I, I don't know, maybe someone did it. And because like it's been going on for like years, this scene, I, I didn't see it. And it might exist in some other place. And it's fine. I mean, like people like your story with the bear that you always say with the, yeah. So, so I mean, so what? So yeah. what? <laughs> it's not, none of this is our property. We're bootlegging. It's like part of the game. Yeah. So that's what's fun about it. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. Like, uh, I have a, like my own character named, uh, astron and it pulls pieces from different things um and i made a prototype and then i worked with um i don't want to mess up the name i think it's motley miscreations and they digitally sculpt and so they uh, redid it and then i got it printed and um i like they changed the pieces so now it it's not anything else now it's just my piece but we all start by stealing like this is yeah, what, exactly like it's that's what this is like it, you you may think i don't know you may think that your piece is great and it might be great it really might be but that doesn't take away from the fact that you stole pieces of it to make your piece and i exactly. i don't know yeah it's also, really tough I, I, I mean you know it's a it's a kind of semantic thing because like you can call it stealing, but in art, usually you just call it, you know, like a collage or like a ready-made right. or like whatever, like yeah. you can call it whatever you want. But even, you know, like the one of the best toys, I think one of the ones I like the most is like a killer bootlegs, a Phantom Star Killer. Yeah. Even that is like a collage of different pieces. It was in the beginning and then it became like its own thing. Right. Uh, which is amazing. Yeah, like and, and, and you can't and you can't look at the Phantom Star Killer and say, oh, but it's like Luke Skywalker's arms. Who cares? It's a Phantom yeah. Star Killer. It's not like a Luke Skywalker with something with something. Yeah, like I when I uh, make customs, I tell the people I'm going to take a different action figure and turn it into you. So if you know action figures, you might know what it was. Yeah, and they're really okay with it. I had one person that said no i want it completely mine and i told him i'm not your person then go find someone else i'm sorry yeah go find a sculptor not a toy maker <laughs> yeah like also you were i was going to charge you 50 dollars. now someone's going to charge you 800 because they're going to sculpt from the ground up exactly so with all this where are you headed where where is this kind of a toy company who's brand new and one of like the pioneers in Israel, where are you headed? Okay. So the things that I'm going to do like, on, like soon is uh, I want to make like Israeli pop culture stuff. Yeah. Because since it really doesn't exist, I mean, you know, Hulk mashups and Star Wars toys, we've seen them all. Yeah, uh, but there's a lot of like culture phenomenons in Israel, like great stuff that people in here, everyone like knows, and and I think it would be amazing to see toys made of those stuff. So I have a few like cooking already, um, and I think like everyone, and specifically because I'm a, like a character designer and illustrator, uh, the dream is like in the end to make like my own thing, like my own figure. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been toying with ideas. I've been sketching a lot. I mean, at some moment it will happen. Uh, the first, like, total original is going to be uh, this Halloween. I have, like, something, make it, I've been making something that, like, again, a silly idea that might have been made before, but I don't care. Uh, but, yeah, I think, like, the, the idea in the end is, like, making, keeping making, like, you know, the pop culture stuff because it's fun and I love it and yeah. sculpting and using, like, like uh, ready-made stuff and whatever but in the end i would love to have like my own line of of toys that's like the dream and again awesome. killer is like the the biggest inspiration in in that like yeah that's great really amazing like the gray ghoul is like fucking awesome yeah hey that i can't wait for that um we as we come to the end part of this uh episode uh, again, one of my favorite parts, I tell every artist this because it really is my favorite. 
I want you to plug everything where everyone can find you if you're on any other interview, everything so that we can get to you. Uh, so it's not too many. Uh, most of it, like all of it is on Instagram. So I yeah. have like the Tiltro uh, underscore toys uh, account that is like the, the toys and the bootlegs. And other than that, than that I have the Royce Eagle account. That's uh, Royce uh, dot Eagle. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's like my illustration and my main account. Um, and that's it, basically. Like, awesome. I mean, I don't exist too much outside of Instagram. Great. Hey, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, man. Thank um, you. It's it's like, I'm, I'm still excited. So and... I have to say, like, to end this, that I think that without Toys on Tap, I wouldn't be doing toys like at the moment because at one of at the moment I found out like the the term bootleg toys. Mm-hmm. Of course, I found like Sacklord than everyone, but one of the first things that I found was like your interviews with Yo-Yo Dine about yeah. the history of bootlegs, and and that's what kind of got me into it. Mm-hmm.